they claim that hypersonic missiles cannot be stopped, that there's no way we can stop our interceptor. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, yes, there is. And I'm going to show you several ways to do it. Not one, not two, but several ways to stop the hypersonic vehicles. Now, imagine this. One of these concepts is for a impenetrable wall of interceptors covering an area of 43 square miles. You will say, no, Greg, it's impossible. Oh, no, it's not. Not at all. <laughs> I have come up with a way to defeat these systems. And Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping are going to be madder than a bucket of hornets. <laughs> their heads are going to explode along with all their generals and admirals and colonels. But not only that, we can stop the entire People's Liberation Army Navy from invading Taiwan. We can defend Guam, yes, and have better missile interceptors than what we have today. These things are all possible, and I'm going to show you how to do these things. <laughs> now, as I get into these concepts, I'm going to have to break it down one at a time, and I'm going to start with a big idea, and then I'm going to break it out and several other ideas. Now, by the way, bear in mind, that all these things merit trade studies, extensive trade studies to optimize and find the best solutions for use of any of these potential scenarios. And that those do take time. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think the engineer just sitting down and design something. There it is. Well, good engineers lay out options and do trades between them to see what's the optimal way to do a job. So uh, definitely I would encourage that. And, oh, yeah, by the way, Northrop Grumman, if you'd like to hire me as a project manager, I know how to do I've been a project manager and I've done trade studies. <laughs> and this primarily is going to benefit you. Now we have, I have a five-year North Grumman pen too, by the way. All right. So my friends, uh, it is, I am Greg Allison, Green Gregs and Galactic Gregs. I'm coming to you on 26 July, 22. Time on deck is 1449 hours Central Daylight Time. I'll do this as a joint video between both my channels because this is space and it is defense, it is prepping, it is all these things. And uh, bear in mind that the, also you need to be aware right now today, there's all kind of potential food shortages and the governments are not helping us with this. They're doing things that are making it even worse. And I covered that on, the, uh, on my Green Greg's channel last. And also, you bear in mind that uh, the potential for warfare around the world right now is off the charts. So really and truly, this is time to prep, to get ready. And it's a good time to go to prepwithgregs.com, prepwithgreg, excuse me, prepwithgreg.com. And you can get a 25-year lasting supply of food. You can get three months worth of it for uh, $150 off right now. It's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Six of these buckets. Each one of these is a two-week supply. It's lightweight. You can bug out with it. Your family, your, your friends can carry these. Your, your kids can carry these. And they're easy to bury and hide because this bucket seal, the pouches are inside are sealed. And my friends, this is the ultimate way to go. It may sound high when you're looking at three months worth of food, but hey, it's only, it's less than $3 a meal. The kind of food that will last you 25 years and you can bury, bug out with easy. You're not going to beat that deal, my friends. But check it out. Also check out my links to... Uh, to grow seeds for your garden. You're going to need that with truly market. All right, enough said about all that. So let's talk about this. First off, let's talk about hypersonics. So I'm going to come up with this grand idea for how to watch this system, at least the top end system and various sub components thereof, <laughs> or smaller scale systems. But it's all, it's all doable. It's all doable. Well, then parameters, okay? Like I said, we need trade studies. So bear in mind, oh yeah, Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin. So you got, you're mad at me right now, but you know, if you want to take me out, it's not going to stop this idea because the cat's coming out of the bag right now. <laughs> so let's talk about, uh, yeah, I'm still a little hoarse. Bear in mind, I do still have the COVID. It's hot as a blaze in this house right now. So let me do a little share. I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about <clears throat> first hypersonic vehicles. <coughs> they are a couple of top types of hypersonic vehicles. There's, there's glide and there is uh, basically a cruise type. And the glide type it can fly higher 
because it can be launched by an inter intercontinental ballistic missile and fly through space uh, and then come in at the terminal phase of the flight where it's coming in on targets. And then there is also the uh, type that is uh, a uh, boost type, a, a cruise missile type. Uh, for a, a hypersonic missile, it would need to run on a scramjet. The scramjets are still experimental. I think uh, even though the Chinese and the Russians have the, the lead in the boost glide, uh, America now has a lead in the scramjet technology, but we're woefully behind. And most uh, people looking to defend ourselves uh, against hypersonics are looking to attack hypersonics with hypersonics. Well, my friends, you don't need that. You don't need that at all. <laughs> and that's really going to waste a lot of money and a lot of time is trying to come up with hypersonic interceptors. We don't need that. So bear in mind, you know, th these have high temperatures, high velocities. Uh, just to give you an idea, yeah, it started out with re-entry vehicles just from uh, uh, for space flight. It was beginning with hypersonics. So here's what you need to know. When a vehicle is traveling through the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds, we're talking Mach 5 or higher, it's getting a lot of friction with the air. And the nose cone and leading edges of, of this vehicle will get extremely high temperatures in an area of 3,000 to 500, no, excuse me, three to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot. That is very hot. Bear in mind, titanium melts at 4,000 degrees. It probably loses structural integrity a little bit shy of that. So uh, for these reasons, what they look at for these hypersonics is using ultra high temperature ceramic material. Yeah, hafnium carbide, tantalum carbide, have extremely high melting points and high resistance to oxygen induced ablation. So uh, yeah, ceramic materials are mechanically and thermally robust. Yeah, to a point, to a point. But what you got to know is this. All you got to do is crack that insulation. All you got to do is crack that insulation. Hang on, I'm going to stop sharing and come back here. All you got to do, if you got a vehicle coming in, it's hypersonic. Let's just say, let's use Starship as an example here. And uh, it's got to have thermal protection where the heat's at. You crack that heat shield, it's over. And just crack it. Just crack it. It's over. And it is what? Ceramic. Remember the space shuttle Columbia? How it failed? It had only wing edges uh, were uh, reinforced carbon carbon. That's right. Hold on. And here. Actually, here. And down. Reinforced carbon carbon. Place like it right over there. Piece of foam, just a little old piece of foam. Yeah, bang, cracked one of those. And when she was at the very high, you know, already in, in the reentry phase, real high up, it got so hot, it, 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 the torch just went right through it and destroyed the subsystems inside the vehicle and the whole vehicle came apart. One crack. These uh, hypersonic vehicles. You know, they're smaller, so their systems are all compact. It is not going to take as much to take them out. And in fact, I would submit that a fragmentation device is all you need. You know, look, I've worked missile defense. You see this poster behind me? That was from when the days when I was working SDI. Oh, that's a calendar, actually, from 1988. It says SDI, 1988, across the top. I worked in the ARIS program, the Exo Atmospheric Venture Interceptor Subsystem. It was the daddy of the ground based interceptor that uh, Bowen has built and filled it in my old duty station at Fort Worley, Alaska, and at Vandenberg Air Force Base. So I know a little bit about missile defense. I know a little bit about kill vehicles. I know about kinetic energy impacts. Hey, we were looking at having a, a basically a, like a, what we had to expand our vehicle for the better the impact was a uh, expandable cushion base space, like a, your, your cushion that, that you get uh, for impact in your vehicle. The ones that blow up when you have an impact, yeah. It was just a 
uh, it was going to shoot gas in this plastic and it was going to pop out and just plastic at the speeds of these reentry vehicles is enough to totally wipe out the opposite side. I've heard some people roll oh, head to head bullet bullet would we'll be used to tungsten them. Like, no, they don't. You know, tungsten needed in this. You know, uh, if you do a direct hit, the hit on the vehicle, just whatever's in the vehicle is enough mass at those velocities to totally destroy the other vehicle. In fact, we even thought at one time that just passing near another vehicle at those velocities might be enough to strip the electrons out and cause it to disintegrate. Yeah, that was found not to be the case. But uh, there was a lot of analysis went into that. Was, uh, it looked possible at one time back in the early 80s when I was involved in this stuff. So <coughs> all you need is a fragmentation device. Now, if you think about a fragmentation device, you can think about like a, a grenade. A grenade? Greg, are you serious? I think, yeah, that was a grenade. Just a plain old grenade has a uh, kill radius of five meters. It's over 15 feet. Over 15 feet, all the way around, whatever's in that 15 feet, you're dead. Was the shrapnel, yeah, never mind movies to show people running around with grenades going off all around. Yeah, if you've ever been in the military and you chain a real grenade, you know better than that crap. <laughs> and frankly, they can actually throw shrapnel 230 feet, but the effective kill radius is five meters. So imagine this. Imagine we have a vehicle that can throw out a whole lot of interceptors. A whole lot of them. And these interceptors would basically be like fragmentation devices, like grenades. And they would have wings and maybe a rocket motor in the back and perhaps divert thrusters to give them some extra directionality. Imagine that. That's one thing you might do. Now, if you've got a kill vehicle coming at you, let's say this is the enemy hypersonic missile. The thing that's characteristic of hy hypersonic missiles is they're maneuverable. All around, you know, certain parameters. They're not going to go like this, but you know, they can definitely change courses. So if you're going to target one of these guys coming in at you, one smart way to do it would maybe to use this say three devices, come at it in three different directions. And then if it diverts one way or another, the one on the side it's diverting to intercepts it or comes at it and intercepts it. And if you're using a fragmentation device, you don't even need to direct intercept. You don't need a head on head collision. Just detonate close to it, crack the uh, uh, shield. You'll probably, det you'll probably blow the whole thing up. But just be, if you can just crack the shield, it is going to come apart. It's not going to survive. So <clears throat> you don't even have to be going as fast as it, as long as you can time yourself right to be at the right spot at the right time to detonate. You don't have to be hypersonic. You don't have to be hypersonic. I guarantee you that all the defense wagons, big uh, industries are like, well, we're going to have a hypersonic interceptor, and we don't even have hypersonic yet. We don't even have hypersonic yet, but we got to come up with a hypersonic interceptor. So this is going to cost umpany, 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 billions of dollars and umpany, 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 30 years to come up with it. Oh, now, if we're lucky and we come up with them, hey, my concept can employ them too. <laughs> but I got a whole lot more in mind than just three interceptors going after a kill vehicle, okay? So imagine this. I was inspired when I did the video on Galactic Gregs yesterday when I was talking about a rapid response launch vehicle to carry cargo from one spot to another, point to point on the surface of Earth. And I said that, you know, your, your, your SpaceX uh, starships, you know, can be useful, ah, perhaps. I'm really doubtful about this. <laughs> the logistics are so horrendous. I'm very doubtful about it, but still, it's a possibility. But, you know, this whole thing, the idea that you're going to get from point A to point B in an hour, no. Uh, you got to spend probably four hours just peeling these things up. But a solid rocket booster, oh, no, no, no. They're ready on demand. You hit that torch, baby, and she's flying. <laughs> get the igniters inside the system. Oh, yeah, I know what the igniters look like. Look, I have been to Promontory where ATK, now north of Grumman, the whole company, builds the uh, solid rocket boosters for what was originally the shuttle and now coming up the space launch system. I've been all through those factories. 
I know how those things work. I've been in, I worked solid rocket boosters when I worked the Aries one program. I worked Aries one. That's what I did. I worked solid rocket boosters. I know all about them. Not only that, I know about solid fuel grains and hybrid rocket motors too, because this is one of my rocket motors. So I have worked a lot of rocket motors. And just to kind of give you an idea, this is the space shuttle. The space shuttle had two four segment solid rocket boosters. Now these each produced, each one of these produced 3.3 million pounds of thrust and burned for two minutes. The Ares one rocket has two of these on board, but they are five segment boosters or longer. They have an entire segment. Uh, added to it for, for fuel. So they're longer and they burn longer, a little, a little bit more than two minutes, and they produce 3,600,000 pounds of thrust apiece, 3.6 million pounds of thrust apiece instead of 3.3. <coughs> Excuse me, so I've got the COVID. So my inspiration to match a SpaceX Super Heavy was to use five of these. Five of these will give you 18 million, well, not off the shuttle, but off the Aries. Five, five segment boosters will give you 18 million pounds of thrust. There's never been anything that big launched before. This one, that would even be more powerful, just a bit more powerful than these First stage of Starship is super heavy, as SpaceX calls it. Well, what can you do with that? <laughs> well, let's say I want to put loaded up with a payload fare and just load it up with sub munitions. And let's say a grenade, what's a grenade? A pound or two? <laughs> so let's say we got a, a five pound payload. It's uh, kind of a delta wing grenade, you know, little bitty. Uh, 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 ultralight type control systems and a uh, little sustainer rocket motor in the back. What, five pounds? I bet you can do that. Five pounds. And let's say we decide to make the payload not 18 million pounds, but 15 million pounds. You know, three million submunitions on this launch vehicle just from the first stage along. So, you know, my idea was, you know, you could build these things with like uh, three different stages. And let's call them SRB-5, for the five, SRB-5-1, first stage, which would have five boosts. SRB-5, uh, second stage, which would be three of them, if you decide you needed a second stage. And uh, you could even put another solid rocket booster up there as a third stage, if you wanted. So you could have a total of nine SRBs all stacked up. And even that first stage by itself, would put out more than enough thrust to lift a fully fuel starship. It's, if on top of it could be a four stage. Holy smoke. Imagine how far that would throw it. And you'd have over six minutes of burn time if you had three stages of solids, or over two if one stage, and over four if two stages. So it all depends on how you want to scale this, what your mission objectives are, uh, how much payload you want to throw out there. <laughs> But if you're trying to protect Guam or someplace like that from hypersonic missiles, which Guam is going to need some serious protection. A lot of our military bases in Okinawa, Guam, military bases in Japan, uh, even military bases right here in the United States could use the kind of protection system that we're talking about. You don't have to send stuff thousands and thousands of miles. But just imagine. Here's the thing. What I said, uh, a grenade has fuel radius five meters. So let's bring it in. Let's just say we're going to take, you know, what's five meters? So 15 foot. Well, let's just square it up and let's let's cut a piece of that circle out and just go uh, 10 foot out each way. And we'll create a square 20 by 20 around this fuel vehicle that we just devised. So what does that give you? It gives you 400 20 by 20, 400 square feet. You know, one kill vehicle with a shrapnel could cover. 
Oh, yeah, we're just talking about three million of them, right? <laughs> if you threw three million of these things out there, <laughs> if you threw three million of these things out there, my friends, three million times uh, 400 square feet is 1 billion, 200 million square feet. Let's say that again. That's 1 million, 2 <laughs> excuse me, 1 billion, 200 million potential square feet to be covered. Guys, how many square feet are there in a mile, square mile? 27,878,400. Divide that into the 1 billion and 200 million, and you get 43 square miles, 43 square miles <laughs> with 3 million interceptors in it, each totally able to uh, create shrapnel to take out anything in that area. Okay, I do recognize there's issues with that. Now. Hang on. <laughs> hey, guys, just, hey, just if you had to ray them up here and detonated them and all that shrapnel falling would create a curtain of debris that any hypersonic vehicle would have to go through. And you could just fire them off in successive waves and create successive curtains to take out various and sundry uh, kill vehicles trying to slip through. <laughs> or uh, hypersonic vehicles. Yeah, your vehicles are kill vehicles. Okay, so now think about this, warheads, I should say. You could take out all these warheads. Uh, now, indeed, if I've got a big payload section at the top of, uh, let's say this is a big payload bearing, flying at the top of uh, this huge booster, and it comes out, you could just open it up, clam shell, and let all these things spread out, or you could have like a drag chute and pull a big pallet out. The whole inside of it could just be hollowed out and be a big uh, cylindrical pallet to start releasing all these munitions. But one way to, to better, so how do you disperse something that widely in that period of time from something like this? So probably a, a way to do that would be to have little sub vehicles within here. Like sub, you got a mother ship and you got daughter ships or granddaughter ships, which would be the sub munitions. So you might could have uh, missiles coming out of here going different directions to get that wider dispersion. And then from them, you get the dispersion. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is not to use a SRB-5 first stage, <laughs> but use the SBR, SRB, excuse me, SRB-5 third stage. It'd be one booster. One booster. One solid rocket booster made into a missile like the Ares-1 rocket, except it used a four-segment booster instead of a five-segment booster could cover an area of over eight square miles. Same thing, eight square miles. So you might want just to have a succession of, you know, Aries one uh, type boosters that, uh, uh, that would launch, you know, we're talking Aries one guys. We, we might have uh, just a, a system of these that would launch and throw out all this payload. Oh yeah, I can show you the Aries one X had a huge payload shroud. So <laughs> it was to mimic the uh, upper stage that was planned at the time. So think about this, guys. This is a lot of capability. And even then, you might want to have some kind of submunitions to, to help disperse it around. With eight square miles, it's still a huge area. So, you know, this part of where you got to have some trades involved, just one area to look at the trades. And I'll show you, you know, but we could scale this down and have smaller versions just coming out of missiles maybe as small as the attacking missile, which could be launched from high bars or uh, MLRS. <laughs> <coughs> so bear with me. And there's precedence for that. I'll show you a little bit. The attacking missile once uh, had some years munitions, and North Realm was actually trying to develop a smart one called BATS. Uh, Brilliant anti-armor or anti-tank, yeah, brilliant anti-tank. I'll show you all that in a little bit. I'm gonna go through these things and show you. So think about this. 
you could cover an area 43 square miles with a, just a curtain of total wall of interceptors all set to go off fragmentary. And maybe out of them, they would pair off in threes and chase out various uh, hypersonic missiles if need be. They probably don't even need that if you get that kind of wall. As soon as they come in, you get close and detonate that signal of the wall. Of course, you know, they're going to stay up for so long, but you, you would time it all when you see the things incoming and then launch. So, yeah, we'll have satellites, hopefully, with, with heat signatures up and watch these things coming. Uh, <coughs> so, all right. Um, another, another system that could be deployed that's totally different would be using lasers. Oh, before I go there, let me go back to these launch spots. Imagine this. If you've got a Aries, I mean not Aries, if you got this SRB five booster, first stage, second stage, whatever, even if you've got to have a second stage, give you the extra throw weight so you might be able to launch it from Okinawa or better yet, Guam, it's not far away. 1,500 miles from Taiwan, open Iowa was 500 miles from the Taiwan Strait. Uh, so if you wanted to have something where you could launch a lot of sudden emissions at the Taiwan Strait, with, uh, oh, hey, let's just go from 3 million. Let's, let's, <laughs> let, let's cut it down to just a few thousand. If you had, if you could rain thousands of uh, Missiles, interceptors, kill vehicles, warheads down on the Taiwan Strait. You could stop the entire Japanese, excuse me, the entire Chinese invasion fleet of Taiwan. All their landing craft come across, you blow them all out of the water. Everyone sink every swing in one of One fell swoop. And you can throw another wave in to mine the waters, keep them sending more. Oh, yeah. Missile defense, regular missiles, all these things that uh, China has got the rocket forces. They want to fling at Guam, Iowa, all these places like that. And they start shooting those things out. We fire these back. First, we fire back the interceptors. Then we fire missiles to have the cruise missiles on board. And I talk about the arsenal ship concept for cargo ships and rockets in my previous video on galactic dregs, I talked about stormtroopers, <laughs> SpaceX stormtroopers. And <coughs> I talked about this AGM-158 JASM, J-S-S-M, which stands for Joint Air to Surface Standoff Missile. It's a cruise missile. Got a range of about a thousand miles. You can fling hundreds, thousands of these things over into China, where they got their rocket forces, and you could take out their stuff. Whenever they had lunch, the command and control centers, and you could you could obliterate them. You could obliterate their command and control centers. You could obliterate whatever missiles they haven't launched already, and the ones that's in flight, hey, off these walls <laughs> of interceptors. Yeah, that'd be the way to do it. Now we're going to talk about more sophisticated interceptor technology. My brilliant pebbles. I'm going to show that in here. And I'm going to show uh, some of our other interceptor missiles that we've got. Just briefly. I'm just going to flow through them here real quick. Give you an idea. Some of these others could be converted to platforms that could carry some few fewer number of interceptors, make up a small version. I'm going to talk about if you want to go after a, one of these guys and say, you, you maybe you want three interceptors. You could fire three agents of shores, or offshores. You could fire you know, three thads at it, but maybe you can have sudden emissions and do it more effectively uh, because three thads after one missile is, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> and we don't have that many thads out there. Uh, attacking for short range when you start coming in, uh, especially for the tactical missiles like uh, the, the Kinzel that, uh, uh, that Russia made out of the Iskander missile, uh, there's ways to, to stop those. 
and you might could use the smaller missile platforms like putting an attack on uh, the high Mars or in the rocket launch rocket system. Of course, you're giving attack ones to uh, Ukraine. Ooh, that would have some range and power then. That might be scary. <laughs> but uh, any of it. These are the ways we can stop hypersonics. I mean, guys, if outside of my not, you know, uh, Air Force Base, you put a bunch of these, you can protect the SAC fleet and even the missiles in the ground uh, from even the direct, uh, regular ICBMs. And also, once you're in the terminal phase, I don't care what hypersonics you got, what the maneuver both is, once they're homing in on target, they're coming on target. They're not going to be maneuvering a lot at that point. They're, uh, so it's going to be easier to get them. So if you have, say, so, uh, some single SRB rockets sitting around with, with uh, a whole bunch of interceptors on them, uh, that many interceptors, they can stop all kinds of stuff, stop one launch. So I think that's the real way to do it, submunitions. So this uh, Arsenal cargo ship inspired me, the idea of the rocket cargo, rocket Arsenal ship. <laughs> so I think this is a potential source for missile, missile defense, coastal defense, a source for uh, uh, stopping the Guam killers, carrier killers, uh, uh, defending Guam, Okinawa, stopping the Chinese invasion, taking out the entire People's Liberation Army Navy. Yeah, you can take out the whole Navy. You can take out the whole rocket forces. You could end instantly any invasion they wanted to take. Who's your thing? It's probably hopping mad now. Why not? People want to throw a thousand reasons. Why not? But really, it's engineering. Yeah, you might have this problem or that problem or this problem or that problem. It's all engineering. I just gave you a broad parameter to do what they said can't be done. All right. Because it's engineering too. It can be done. Well, there'll be trade studies and alternate work and things how you get to these actual solutions, how you really <coughs> implement it. These things are double. Let's do it. Well, let's go through. Let's do some more screen shares. Kind of go through some things here real quick. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But here's a hypersonic missile on a B 52. Uh, even the Indians, even the Indians, I got an idea, are in on this. This is an Indian. Hypersonic research missile. I mean, the Indians are smart people, guys. They are smart people. Fight Zoom to try to get the next tab. Ah, I'm going to try to get to it. Zoom controls go down. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> That's another. Here. This is another Indian vehicle. Fortunately, Indians are not our enemies. All right, here is the, the uh, Artemis one launch vehicle. Here is your five segment motor. One, two, three, four, five. Got your Ford skirt up here with avionics. There is some avionics, mostly a TVC control materials down here in the aft skirt. Those assembly no longer has, uh, no longer has uh, parachutes and that like that give the shuttle bay. It's easier to be expendable. Now, to make this whole thing cheaper and lighter weight and have more payload weight, you could come up with, with a with a composite motor case, and that would make them burn up better on the entry too. And the uh, heavy duty cases that these systems have filament wound case. That's what uh, a, uh, that's what uh, Aerojet was looking at doing it at Ayuk at one time. Got shut down. All right, here's your Ares 1 launch vehicle to give you an idea. This is a launch vehicle. They had a four segment, they had a dummy fifth segment, but it's a four segment SRB. My friend David Hewitt came up with the idea to put stripes on it like the old, uh, <laughs> the old wrist on rocket and the V2s before it. 
So let's see. We do that. So that can come to okay. So the mission profile. Okay, we recovered the boosters for this one. There it is on the pad. Going to the crawler. This one out to the launch pad. And it is just being launched. So this, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Right here. It could do. You see that big upper stage simulator there? There was no upper stage there. There was no actual Orion capsule on it. But you got a huge area for payload that you could put on a booster like this. A huge area. You could put a whole lot of sudden munitions in there. You could really pack it with a lot of stuff. This has been done. Just on this. So this is not outrageous. Oh, but Greg, it costs so much. Well, compared to the kind of defense you're offering, no. And Greg, what about production capabilities? Well, uh, the plant at, uh, at Promontory, Utah, where uh, Northrop Grumman produces these solid rocket boosters. It used to be Thiokol, then became ATK, now it's Northrop Grumman. They uh, set up to produce, uh, and originally they were going to fly 30, uh, 60 shuttles a year. We never flew 60 shuttles a year. So we could probably produce uh, over 100 of these uh, solid rocket boosters there. Let's say 120, except we're doing five segments instead of four segment boosters. Because uh, the, the Arnold's program is only looking to use two to four a year. It's not that many. Here's another uh, solid rocket booster, uh, Athena 1 rocket. So there, there is a lot of experience using things like this. Space shuttle solid rocket boosters again. See, these guys, uh, that's what they look like on separation. Actually, we tested them up in uh, Promontory, Utah. At the uh, plant, static fire. I'm in the static fire. <coughs> These things would burn for two minutes. They would, uh, uh, they would go like 120 miles down range before they were, uh, where they were parachuted in from the ocean, roughly. Uh, they were, uh, which isn't that far down range, but these guys were aiming. To go high, they were going for altitude. Let's just try and get the space shuttle up. If you're aiming at targets, you might be aiming it up this way instead of up that way, so you'll get a lot more altitude. So they made it to an altitude of 28 miles and made about 200 and some odd, yeah, 122, excuse me, 122 nautical miles down range to the ocean. So you get more cross range if you're not going so high. But you might want to go high if you're taking out high ICBMs. And then again, if you need more range from the basic boosters, you can always make this thing a second stage system and get four minutes of burn time instead of uh, two. And like I said, these uh, uh, five seven boosters will have more thrust than this and a longer burn time. We'll start out with five call, like I mentioned. In ATK, it is now north of Drummond. So that's a thrust profile. You know, the, the, the fuel grains are cut such so that when you're maximum pressure in the atmosphere, the thrust actually drops and it picks back up again. That's the way they star the fuel grains just right so they're burning that profile. All right. This is the JASM, the AGM-158. JASM Joint Air to Surface Standoff Missile with a range of 1,000 miles. It's a cruise missile. Lockheed Martin makes this. This is what one of the missiles I was mentioning uh, for your palletized weapon systems to come out of an arsenal ship, airship, cargo ship, or rocket ship. Now, this is Brilliant Pebbles. I want to show you this because uh, yeah, there is no tungsten or anything in here to act as a warhead. This whole thing, just its own mass colliding with the object, will take out the object it collides with. 
these things, uh, you may have seen the video of these things flying around in a building, uh, diverting back and forth with nets around them. So these divert thrusters, you can fly these things, kind of like a helicopter, but just these divert thrusters. It's very directional. You can get a lot of thrust out of these and really chase down the payload. So if you really want to chase something down, you got the forward velocity order given you by the rocket boost, you're practically hypersonic, especially if you're at high. Uh, you can have a lot of maneuverability with a system like this. So a brilliant pebble is a decent uh, alternative uh, for these uh, collision devices I was talking about. Put a fragmentation grenade in it up here, a warhead, to give you that extra, you don't have to hit it bullet to bullet if you're going after hypersonic. If you've got enough of these, chase them down the hypersonic vehicles. And look, we could put thousands and thousands of these in, uh, the kind of vehicles I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, we need these in orbit too to protect us uh, up there from uh, the glide, glide phase of these various systems that can shoot at us. If we had enough of these, we could have a total, I believe we could have a total missile defense system. This is the uh, descendant of the program I work on. It's based in Fort Greeley, it's anti-ballistic missile. Uh, developed by Boeing. Uh, you got this one is at a silo at Fort Greeley, Alaska, my old duty station. We got them at Vandenberg, too, but it's more at Fort Greeley. These are meant to take out intercontinental ballistic missiles. They're not good for uh, taking out hypersonic missiles at all. And there's a limited number of these. So, they're, you know, th this will not take out a full scale Russian attack. These were scaled to be able to deal with North Korea and only North Korea, not Russia or China. They got way more missiles than this system could take care of. Aegis ashore and Aegis at sea on the ships, uh, those missiles might be a lot better for, for overall defense because uh, we do have a lot more of them. But still, we, we can't really cover a full, presently, a full launch suite. Now, you could take a few of these missiles, and again, and put in some munitions instead of the warheads they got. And who knows, maybe that way you could uh come after a hypersonic missile that's a trade study somebody can figure out down the road yeah i give it that. <laughs> and here's the aegis ballistic missile defense system these were originally developed to be launched with ships and uh, this is what she looks like you get the booster got uh, all these other stages in here we have the kill vehicle here guidance section yeah, we got something like this back in this other page I'm going to show you. This guy. There's something showing the whole kill up in there. It's a secret. Lightweight at, at so atmospheric. Projectile. Okay, that's some earlier anti ballistic missiles. Concept from 1946. So the idea is go back. I'm still married. Just saw it. Oh, Hmm. Oh well. There's your fat terminal high altitude aerial defense. It used to be called fear. Here's your bad missile. This is kind of the next step down below uh, strategic missile defense, but this is a theater missile defense missile. That's a good size missile. You could put submunitions in this one to go after hypersonic. That's an idea. By itself, it's not a hypersonic defeater. And if you launch three of them, you might be able to go up your hypersonic missile with it. 
but that's a whole lot of missiles. Why don't you kill one hypersonic missile? I prefer something like your SRB that you throw up a whole lot of solid rocket boosters, throw up a whole lot of a whole lot of boosters to go after your missile. Ah, oh, this is something I was looking for. Yeah, this is this is a this is your kill vehicle. Yeah, this is the diagram I was looking for earlier. This is with a Thad missile and it's showing a steerable nozzle down here. And it's showing this kind of avionics and the systems. This is a whole lot like the Eris vehicle that we work on. Not that dissimilar. We've all got similar subsystems in it. This is all publicly available, guys. This is all out on Wikipedia. <coughs> There's Patriot Missile. That's a good size missile, too. We're all familiar with that. That's a good uh, surface to air missile. It's good for. Uh, Taking out a lot of uh, bad boys. They were very effective in the first Gulf War. In the second Gulf War, my son worked in the Patriot. The Patriot Project Office used to be right next door to me when I worked in missile defense. And these were developed in Huntsville, Alabama, just like so many other missiles. Yeah, so the Patriot was developed at Redstone Arsenal. Hey. I'm seeing you do video. Um, uh, not that building, but I'm close to it. That's where it's unlocked. So look here. Iron Dawn, this is Israel's version of missile defense. Of course, they're just shooting at cheap uh, uh, rockets. You know, not anything sophisticated, just regular rockets that his bowl or somebody might fire at him. But you know, it's just giving them a pretty effective defense. Um, that might be more like sudden emissions would be fired from our systems. And now here we go the MGM 140 Attackums rocket, which is launched from the M270 multiple launch rocket system or the M142 High Mars. This is from the M270. Uh, multiple launch rocket launch system here. This is a big, short, blunt missile. It's got a, uh, a high MRs uh, or a uh, multiple launch rocket system you could in these launchers. This could carry two of them. High MRs could carry one. Now this rocket has got a diameter, let's see, uh, 24 inches. So you can put submunitions in it. In fact, they have had submunitions in various versions. I'm going to show you one of them right here. Brilliant anti-tank. This was a concept that Northrop Grumman come up with, a submunition that come out of the attackums that would, uh, it would be a smart one. It would go after tanks. And there was fully fielded. But this is an idea that says, hey, we could put submunitions in smaller rockets and have effectivity. Uh, let's see, picture shown down here. Let's see, picture. Anyway, well, there we go. Now, like I said, the inspiration for this was this video I did right here Starship Troopers, where I'm talking about the use of uh, rapid response point to point cargo vehicles that would use a solid rocket motor instead of a Starship. And that got re and I was talking about cargo ships, I mean arsenal ships, also in this talk. And that really got my wheels turning. And I started connecting dots and doing a little math. And I said, Holy smoke, we can probably take out the uh, hypersonic missiles. This is my Green Grapes channel. This is a video where I was talking about you know, coming after the farms over there <laughs> and food and so forth. All right, stop the share. Been going for a while now. So basically, we can take out hypersonic missiles. Now you may go, Greg, that's ridiculous. You know, three million submissions and blah, 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 blah. Oh, hey, let's go to single rock stick rocket. We can still cover something like eight square miles with the printed shore wall of interceptors. <laughs> so uh, maybe need sub missiles to, to disperse them. Okay, fine. If that's what you need. 
like I said, we'll need to have some trade studies to see what's the optimal way to do these things. And it would be several trade studies looking at, uh, you can tell with various, so many permutations to this, it's not funny. You could do a lot of trade studies on this to figure out the optimal way to approach these things, but you can do it with assets we already have. You can take technology that already exists right now and stop hypersonic missiles. Bye bye, Mr. Vladimir Putin, Mr. Xi Jinping. Your missiles are trying to scare us, but not so much. Oh, yeah. Two other things I want to bring up lasers. Yeah, let's talk about torpedoes. While we're at it, let's just cover the whole defense gauntlet. Lasers. How many, if you stuck with me to this point in the video, put lasers in the chat below. <coughs> lasers are faster than hypersonic missiles, of course. The problem with laser is, as I said, if you got a ground facility and you're trying to shoot a laser way out here, you're shooting up to a lot of atmosphere, getting over to it, miles and miles and miles. That laser is going to spread out. And we get to that target, if it's very far away, you don't have any strength to it. Uh, if you're shooting nearby targets, like you're in a ship and you got a drone coming at you, fine. If you're trying to take an intercom ballistic missile coming at you that's 100 miles away, you ain't going to hear it. If you do, it's not going to hurt it. <laughs> the beam's going to be too diffuse. It's going to spread out too much. There is a way. High altitude airships. Once you get above most of the atmosphere, well, I floated balloons. In, when I was floating balloons to launch rockets, this one, or like the one I got the Guinness Book of World Records on, or this award, watch rockets and altitude balloons. You put a balloon at 20 miles high, you're above 99% of the atmosphere. At that point, you can fire a laser for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles, maybe thousands of miles. <laughs> so if you had a good high-altitude airship, now they're coming up with some very compact lasers. They're talking about putting on combat aircraft now, probably from flying and things. That might be enough. Crack a heat shell. Yeah, enough extra heat on that. Uh, TPS, but more than that, uh, is going outside its design parameters. Crack that heat shield on that incoming hypersonic, and boom. Now, if you need a laser more powerful than you put on that airship, just put a mirror on airship, some mirrors, dither mirrors, dither mirrors and have a huge ground-based laser that fires straight up. You don't have to fire diagonally across the atmosphere. So it's got less distance to transverse, like maybe, you know, less than 20 miles. Straight up. As the atmosphere loses density, it's higher you get. So straight up, and then you have directional mirrors from it. So we can put these all out on our coast. Airships or lasers. <laughs> Yeah, I worked on a concept, what I call the Strato Clipper, over 20 years ago. Very high altitude airship, just for these kind of purposes. <coughs> so that's the way you can also stop these. That's a whole other way. A whole different technology should work. What about, look, guys, the Russians got this Poseidon nuclear powered, nuclear armed torpedo. Now the Chinese had to come up with a nuclear torpedo. So if this is a regular sized torpedo with a small nuclear engine propelling it, but it can go 6,000 miles. Why don't we just put an underwater dew line all out in the ocean, starting out around the Hawaii Island chain and coming back so we can have high degree of fidelity of detecting what's in the ocean. Just a raise and a raise of sensors. And then we could develop a torpedo kind of like the one Chinese has. You know, super, it needs to be super cavitated with a nuclear engine behind it. So it can have the range, like a conventional torpedo. And then when we detect uh, incoming torpedoes, we can intercept it with a torpedo. It don't need to be as big as the Russian, you know, SAR bomber torpedo, the Poseidon, uh, status six, whatever you want to call it. It could be the size of torpedoes you can shoot out of regular tubes. Like the ones the Chinese are coming up with. 
And when we do that, then we can have our, our, our ocean defenses, we can have our sky defenses, we can have defenses in space and buoyant pebbles to stop any attack. And one of the things we've got to first do is we send this presidential directive 60 that says we'll absorb the first uh, strike from any enemy. A suicide. That is insane. We ought to haul up Bill Clinton and charge him for treason just for coming up with that. And maybe every president since him should be charged for aiding and abetting. Every single one of them. Spare none. That's, that's horrendous policy to have. That's got to be changed. If we give Trump the field, the field will switch that next time through. That is treason. We should never have a policy that, that says we're going to absorb the first strike. No. Because then we're, we're wiped out. We're laid bare to nuclear blackmail from anybody at that point. That's stupid. I did a video talking about that. Well, I talked about how, Alaska, how Russia could destroy the United States and take Alaska. <laughs> I lived there too, two years. It worked really, it was muscle hard. So, been around, guys. I've done a lot of things. Built rockets, worked on rockets. I've worked on the solid rocket boosters. I've worked on missile defense. I've built my own rockets. So, worked on space stations. And I'm a prepper. I got a lot cabin I built. I got a worm farm out here. I got market garden. So, done a lot of things in my days. And I'm an inventor and an engineer. I won't tell an engineer what we can't do. We can stop the hypersonics. Absolutely. We can stop an invasion of Taiwan. We can stop the People's Liberation Army Navy plan. We can sink their ships, every single one of them, all at once, if we so choose. So I hope Xi Jinping is quaking in his boots. Hey, I don't want to attack you. Just don't start anything, okay? <laughs> you had a great life going there in China until you got all kind of military adventurous on us. Now your whole country's imploding. This, 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 this. The whole world looked up to you. We were so happy to trade with you. Look what you did. This, this. Hey, old Chinese people, consider that. Anyway, all you uh, American school kids that think comedy is so great, this tis. <laughs> all right, guys. Now I'm going to say thank you for watching. Subscribe, bang that notification bell, click all, and 